Welcome to Inside City Hall. I'm your host, Mayor Daryl Seymour, and today our first guest is Brian Russell from the Sholo Fire Department and Kirk Webb from Lakeside Fire Department. Welcome, Brian. Good morning. Glad to have you, Kirk. Good morning. Glad to be here. Today we want to talk a little bit about uh, fire restrictions. We have just recently changed our fire restric restrictions to stage two. Would you guys like to just share a little bit about what the difference is from going from stage one to stage two? Basically, stage two restriction is where we eliminate campfires in all properties, whereas stage one, a person can have a campfire in their backyard. Stage two prohibits that. Um, pretty much limits you to about the only thing that you can use is a pro, uh, LP or petroleum gas type fire in a confined UL approved device. So something that can be immediately shut off and it is there. So charcoal is out, wood is out, and it's strictly, you can still have your wood fire in your home, but other correct. than that, yes. anything outside is excluded. That's correct. Okay. Tell us a little bit about smoking and, and those things, because that's something that sometimes will start a fire as well. At this point, smoking is, we're letting people know that uh, keep it inside of an enclosed building or an enclosed vehicle. No smoking out in the open, where before stage one, we allowed them to clear an area and, and be allowed to smoke in that open area that's free of any kind of combustible materials. But now it's, we've, we've elevated our, our levels and of what we're watching for and, and making sure that, you know, we've gotten from precautionary to things are now extreme and, and it can, just a small spark can set off a, a, a tremendous place. Right, right. Uh, as far as anything else, I, I think I got to commend you guys for doing a great job here this year. It seems like right now we're extremely dry, but there's been more notification that has been done this year than I have seen in the past. We have our, our signs that over on, on 60, 260 there that's talking about it. We have other uh, informational signs that's talking, and, and I've been in several restaurants that have had the, the, the information packet that's distributed through there. How did that happen? and was that the yeah, kudos to you guys as, uh, for putting those out? I'd say mostly trial and error <laughs> and finding out that was one of our biggest complaints was public education and forewarning was never kind of done before in the years past and we talked about it last year and uh, public education has been a big implementation this year. Oh, well, and, and we have a group called our White Mountains Fire Restrictions Coordinating Group, which is comprised of lots of different agencies, both Apache and Navajo County emergency management teams, uh, police departments, fire departments, sheriff's departments, uh, Forest Service, BLM, all those different agencies that, that deal with this type of restrictions. And we actually have finally gotten all of our restrictions pretty much on the same where it doesn't matter what area jurisdiction you're in, it's going to be interpreted pretty close to the same. There might be slight differences, but we're we're handling them as much of the same as possible. So we're going into the same time, and so with that, we're we're sending out the same messages, the same uh, information that we're getting out. In fact, uh, we've got the signboards coming out of Globe. I noticed. Um, and, and wherever we can, we're getting them posted so people coming up this way from out of the valley get notified as well on the, uh, the ADOT signs and things like that. So it's a, a huge effort on everybody's part getting this word out. The county has printed a whole bunch of stuff for us. Uh, and we're disseminating. In fact, we went out last week and talking to <laughs> business owners and saying, look, you know, maybe if you don't mind, pull the charcoal and, and bundles mm -hmm. of wood and lighter fluid, things like that off the shelves as possible, or at least post a sign saying it's not okay to have an open campfire. Right, that's fantastic. And, yeah, they've been very, very helpful with us on that and, and very cooperative. Okay, so, and it's everybody's effort. I, I believe we got through Memorial Day weekend without a fire, and a couple of years ago, that's when the wall of fire started was on Memorial Day weekend, and we had a lot of people up here, and, and for the most part, I think people followed the restrictions that were in place. And it was kind of confusing because here we posted stage two on Friday at, at eight o'clock, and at 10 o'clock, it was, it was raining, and mm -hmm. we appreciated the rain, the moisture, but it's not enough to completely change those conditions. No, yeah. it's going to take days and days of moisture yeah. to... Right. <laughs> and and fortunately, we we've implemented a pretty good social media campaign as well. We, we use uh, 311info.net pretty heavily, and that's... That's good. That's where we recommend folks to go because that's our vetted information. So. Now, there's also more restrictions because there is just... Uh, 
you know, not just campfires, there's sparks that can come from vehicles, from welding, also from chainsaws. Let's talk a little bit about what the restrictions are there. Basically, welding is not prohibited unless it's in an approved area. Um, we do have the ability to make certain exceptions for that for folks who are in need, uh, utility companies or private contractors that, that we ask that they just call us and pre-set that up. We'll gladly come out, look at the area, do a survey, make it as safe as we can and put the appropriate fire protection in place. Uh, up to and including, if available, we'll put a fire truck or a similar apparatus on standby for them if we have the means at that time. So we're, we're just trying to get folks to do it as safe as possible. You know, chainsaw, if you're in the forest, you have to follow their regulations. Chainsaw use, we, we just ask folks, if you have a question, call us and we'll try and get you through it the best we can. That's fantastic. Now vehicles have been restricted to the main asphalt roads or the main uh, public roads not leaving the roadways, things that way as well. Yeah, a lot of people don't think about uh, the catalytic converters that our vehicles are equipped with these days. Those things can get very hot and just simply pulling off of the roadway into a grassy area, there's enough heat coming off of that that's generated that can, can actually start a, a grass fire and can potentially go into other structures, forest or whatever may, need, may be nearby and stuff. So ask people to think about where they're pulling off, make sure it's in a, in a graveled area, not into the grass and uh, things like that. So just be aware of your surroundings and, and, and what can, you know, people that just still have a habit of throwing cigarettes, that's, that's never okay, that's littering. Right. And the Sheriff's Department is actually very uh, adamant and they're, they're going after people that are doing that and they will issue citations. Well, I think we need to be aware, too, uh, with the vehicles, if we're pulling something, uh, that some, a lot of times the chains, mm -hmm. they, they're a little bit long, and they will, will make a spark and, and cause you know, potential fires that have been determined to be caused from a chain that just is dragging. So yeah. when we hook up to our trailers and get ready to leave town, we need to be aware that we either tape those chains up a little bit or do what we can to make sure they're not dragging, too. Right. And flat tires. Flat, yeah, very yeah, the, much so. the, the flat tires on, on your trailer, you, it may be, you know, so be constantly looking in your mirrors, which we should do as a good driver anyway, but uh, if, if we happen to notice a flat, stop and get it checked because just sparks coming off the metal rim hitting the asphalt uh, has started fires. It can be extremely hot there. Now we got Freedom Festival coming up here, some of the exciting times that we shoot fireworks as a city at, under the direction of the police de uh, fire department. Tell us a little bit about what our plans are, what the restrictions are on fireworks. I know fireworks are not allowed in the city limits, uh, and we have to be extremely careful there. And I know people will come and they'll say, well, then why does the city shoot fireworks off on the 4th of July when there are no firework restrictions you know, in our community, or there are fireworks restrictions? So let's talk about that a little bit. Well, fortunately, what we, we found is uh, permittable Public displays are always allowed under state law, uh, but the, re the requirements to do that are pretty hefty. You have to have qualified shooters. They have to go through an assessment. Your sites have to be verified and permitted. That's just something a lot of folks just, they don't have the means to go through. And folks like fireworks. So we still try to offer that as a public display. It's kind of a tradition. But we do make sure that the safeguards are in place. We do have roaming patrols looking for hot spots. So they look check our fallout fields. We, we have a lot of implementation of safety that goes into these shows every year. Whether folks will ask us, well, we're in stage two restrictions, we put safeguards in place for that. The only time that we really won't shoot is when we're in a red flag condition, which is high wind, relatively low humidity in the, in the single digits, or we have weather events that come in that, that make our fallout field less controllable. So um, it's just, something that we work on but we try to assure the public we do have we bring in trucks from all around the community to help support this from forest service to state land to other jurisdictional agencies that do nothing but drive around and, and look for hot spots and all of our shooters go through training they get the hands-on experience and yeah it's it's dealing with explosives definitely definitely so, it's something that we need to be aware of and, and know that that's, you guys have the training, we have the resources, we have the fire trucks, we have, like you say, several, a lot of people on guard ready to immediately be able to extinguish a fire if something got started. Yeah, we, we just want to impress on the public to let them know that if it's an unsafe condition, 
we won't shoot. But if the conditions are allowable, we, we try to accommodate that tradition as much as we can. Right. And it's something that. we're monitoring right up to the time of prior to setting them off, too, so we can shut it down at any time. Right. You know, last year it was one of those things that we were in question whether or not we would shoot the fires, and we had the Yarnell, you know, tragedy that mm -hmm. just happened on that. But I think what happened at the uh, football field that night and the tribute that you guys were able to put together for those fallen uh, comrades, it was it was something that was just spectacular that will always be remembered in this community as well And as we go through that. Tell us a little bit about the next stage if we had to go to stage three. Uh, I don't ever really want to talk about it, but but if we had to go to the next stage, there is one more stage, correct? On well, stage three, actually, when you're looking at uh, that through the, as the way the Forest Service looks at, they look they, that's called closure. Um, now, if we try to equate that to what we're doing in the cities and towns and, and county jurisdictions, if there's really not a way to close the town down or city down unless we're evacuating. So that's kind of stage three as far as in, inside the city and town areas is if we have to evacuate. Okay. So hopefully, like you said, hopefully we never get there. But we're, we're doing training, um, you know, looking ahead, if looking at potential areas that may be more susceptible to wildland fire and, and its, its approach and whatnot. Because realistically, a fire can start anywhere within the, within the town right. as well as outside of town. So the Forest Service, if they moved to stage three, they would probably just start with particular areas first and before, but they may have to call a complete forest closure too. Generally, a lot of times what they do is they'll do selective closures under stage two. Um, they'll, the isolated areas south of town and, and some of the areas to the east. Generally, a stage three is complete closure of the forest. It is prohibited access. Um, the only people in or out are designated employees of the Forest Service or severity patrols. That's great. Well, I think you guys are doing a fantastic job. We appreciate, you know, what you have done and what you continue to do to keep our community safe of fire. It's one of those things that we just, you know, have to hope that we will have the rain and the moisture that we have had in years past. And, but at the same time, there isn't a lot of uh, forecast. We do have to have moisture. And so people, hopefully they're, they're wise to the fact that, you know, whatever they can do to prevent their own homes through taking down the debris. We have uh, the next couple of weeks in the community where we can get rid of some of our, our trash and some of those things that we'll be picking them up and keeping those weeds, you know, down and things like that. And we, we, we encourage folks to keep working through that no matter what they can and take advantage of those opportunities. Great. Is there anything else that you guys are working on or other programs that you've been sharing with the community? We're still doing a lot of the our Ready, Set, Go program mm -hmm. presentations and you know we still have people that uh, haven't made it up for the summer yet and so we're still trying to provide that education as well. Um, doing a lot of even working with uh, city employees uh, doing fire extinguisher training. That's something else that we can provide to the public and businesses and you know, teach people how to use an extinguisher and kind of how to be prepared ahead of time for whatever the case might be. Right. And we have red tag, green tag going on right now, which is a home property assessment. Um, we just encourage folks to contact us if they have any questions or concerns about their review of the property and we'll come out and talk with them and, and give them some encouragement and advice. Well, that's fantastic. Well, thanks so much today for being on our show. We appreciate it, Brian, as always. Thank you. What you do, and Kurt, thank you. Appreciate the time. Stay tuned for our next segment of Inside City Hall, where we'll have Carrie Natselli from the Sholo Recreational Department. Welcome back to Inside City Hall. Our next guest is Recreational Coordinator Carrie Natselli from the City of Sholo. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you, Mayor. For Good to have you always. again, as always here. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the 4th of July. It's one of the biggest events that happens at Sholo, Arizona every year and we get excited about our parade and the festivities and the thousands of people that come up. So tell us a little bit about this year, the theme and what's happening that might be a little different if we're doing anything different or just let's just start with the parade here, okay? It's, it's certainly my biggest event throughout the year and uh, this year I expect it to be really big being that it's a um, campaign year we usually get a lot of uh, floats from that area. We had approximately 120 floats last year and so I expect we'll have about 150 this year. 
If you haven't seen it, you're definitely missing out. It's, it's a huge spectacle of patriotism that flows down the Deuce of Clubs, and it's just wonderful. It kicks off at 9 a.m., uh, just about the Owens entrance to the Deuce of Clubs there. We travel all the way down the Deuce of Clubs and then wrap around and come back in on Hall um, to D-Stage. So we do have a wet zone down there, um, just about from the Thunderbird Motel to the corner of 260 and White Mountain Boulevard. So if you don't want to get wet, you definitely want to stay out of that area. We do post that it's a wet zone, but the kids love it. The, right. the fire department gentlemen that were just here bring their trucks out. They have the big hose that shoots off and covers the street and the kids run out and get soaking wet. And it's, it's, it's great fun. You know, those people have been sitting there the longest to wait for the parade to get to them, so they're a little hot, so it's a great place to soak them down. Yes, you'd think at that early in the morning that they wouldn't be ready for it, but they certainly are, and I know I am. I, I, I would appreciate a douse off, but no, <laughs> got to stay dry for the rest of the day. Now, is it, it is actually on the 4th of July is the day that we'll be having the parade this year. It is the 4th. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I have had several calls about that, but we, we do actually do it on the 4th. Um, what is, what is this year's theme, the theme for the parade? A family 4th of July. All right, so it's going back to the old-fashioned family, what maybe families do. I know we have some old families in our community that we've, we've asked to be uh, the master, well, I guess it'd be, what, what's the proper word? The, that they will be our grand marshals, grand marshals for this that's year. It. So that's that. perfectly said. We will have some of the original families that helped establish this community. Um, be our, our Grand Marshals for this year's parade. So I have some that are definitely confirmed, some that are not quite yet, so I, I don't want to say 100%, but I know we'll have uh, the Gilmore family. Uh, we should have, um, I actually contacted your office as well, Mayor. Uh -huh. So we'll see if we can get you out there oh, too. Yeah. We're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're not completely original, but we've been here a long time. <laughs> But yes, uh, a lot of the original uh, original families that have been here for, for years. And That's so um, I'm hoping everybody will come out and enjoy that as well. Okay. Now, after the 4th of July, the parade, it starts at 9 o'clock, and it's a long parade. It usually lasts about an hour and a half, sometimes up to two hours, that we actually have the Deuce of Clubs, you know, closed during that time. But one of the things that we have afterwards is the festivities where families can get together. But I think it's one of the things that we try to get people to, to have a little bit of leisure time with their families, but then come back together over at the football field. And that starts at what time? The Freedom Festival over there. Three o'clock this year. We do try to give them just a little bit of a, a break, but you definitely want to come back out. We announce the um, parade winners okay. at Freedom Fest. I forgot to mention that. What, what are the categories in the parade that we're judging for this year? We will have the Judge's Choice, which is a $500 cash prize, Best Use of Theme, $300, and Best Display of Patriotism for $300 as well. That's great. And I love that we do it at Freedom Fest now. We've done that last couple years. Um, that way all the parade participants come back out and see you know who they did and who who the winners are and what would be neat is if maybe we could if we have those ahead of time if we could convince the people to bring their floats out and stage them somewhere maybe over at the football field or something so so they could at least be seen by everybody maybe i don't know if it's just a suggestion absolutely if you're interested in, <laughs> in participating or bringing your your float back out please contact me and we well, will especially make if they're one of the winners to, you know if we could let them know a little bit ahead of time and then they can get have their it out float there, back out there that's yes. a great idea possible it gets kind of kind of crazy to move around at that parking lot so that will start at three o'clock at the football field and what are some of the activities that we have going on there we are going to have, we normally do a kids zone. This year it's going to be bigger and better than ever. We, we have a few rides for the teenage adult group as well. Uh, so it's not just necessarily little kids, but we will have the bounce house. We'll have um, a giant inflatable obstacle course that the kids run through. Everything is Western themed this year, so it's going to be really cute. You'll see lots of cactuses and we'll have a mechanical bull. So if you're brave enough to come out and try the mechanical bull, we certainly encourage you to. Uh, we'll have a Western shooting game. Just all kinds of great, great fun stuff for, for the kids to enjoy. Will we have some food there as well? Oh, we've got some of the, all the great stuff you would expect from, you know, a wonderful, you know, fair types food. We'll have Sonoran dogs, funnel cakes, 
the giant plates of curly fries that you see people walking away with, kettle corn, which you can see the giant pot there and then mixing it up, you can smell it from the parking lot. And I hope everybody comes out and enjoys the great, great food that we have offered there. You know, many years I have, I've sat and watched the, the fireworks over like my sister's house or on a different street or somewhere. Well, last year I actually took the time and was down on the football field and it was incredibly so much better to, to brave the crowd, to get out early, to enjoy everything that was happening there. And then we had a band that played last year. And but just sitting there watching the fireworks underneath them as opposed to from the site and have the music that we have coordinating going on that you can hear. Now this year we have some bands that are coming and we'll be playing again. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? We will have Due West returning. They were our headliner last year. They come all the way out from Nashville. So um, we had a great, um, they were received very well last year and so we, we hope to we hope to see as many people out again to, to see them and support them. They're a great group of guys and they cover some some classics and do a lot of their own original material, mm -hmm. but um, they're, they're a great band, great group of guys. We will have them and I, I'm glad to hear that you know you made it out to the field and I would like to encourage you know the residents to do that as well. I, I know it is a little bit of you know, facing the, the braving the crowds and stuff, but there's plenty of room out on the field. Bring your blanket, bring your camping chair. The bleachers are always full um, because you do get to see the tribute for the Yarnell firefighters and things like that that we do on the field that you can't necessarily see from right. from home. And so. I think last year that tribute was just fantastic. Uh, the way it went there, the the feelings, the the reverence of of that happening and, and it's really a, about our patriotism and, and being totally involved 100% uh, there. So it's, it's great. Well, we appreciate what's happening here coming up uh, for Freedom Festival. I don't know about all these politicians and the parade. I guess we can throw things at them <laughs> if we don't like them and things like that. But, but when I talk about throwing things then we got, we got to cover that a little bit because there are certain things that they can be thrown from. Uh, or if you want to give out candy, there's a certain way to do it. So let's talk a little bit about if you do have a float. And I think it's one of the things that, that I've always been a little concerned about is children running towards to get things. And there's the safety, and I hope that people realize that parades are not just always fun. There have been some tragic things that have happened. We've even had you know, a death occur at one of our stagings before a parade here in the city of Sholo. So it's something that we have to be aware of where our children are and, and what they're doing. And so we do allow them to sit on the curb and to be able to be there on the curb, but we do ask them that if you are a participant in the parade, that, that you have walkers that give out the candy and that we don't allow things to be thrown from, from the floats. But I think children need to realize that they shouldn't run up close to those vehicles at all. Sometimes candy gets dropped or something and, and I hope that parents will realize that some of those equipments, it's very hard when you're driving a float to be able to see it all the way around that float at all times. And, but many of them are very big vehicles too. Absolutely. Safety is our utmost importance and, and we want to do everything we can to prevent an accident. So I do want to encourage residents to please do not allow your children to run you know, out into the street next to the floats. They are huge, you know, large, hard to maneuver floats. And we also have several equestrian. So we don't want anybody, mm -hmm. you know, God forbid a child getting trampled, anything like that. So please encourage your children to stay at the curbside. All of the floats are not permitted to throw candy from the float. So they are allowed to have curbside walkers that should be as close to the curb as possible to toss the candy to the children on the curb from there. Right. So please don't allow your children to run out into the street. Uh, I'm doing everything in my power to encourage the floats not to throw candy from the float. They should have their walkers. So for parade participants, please try to stick to the guidelines as well. It is for the safety of, of our community children and you know right. we want to do everything we can to, to protect them. Well, one of the things that's nice that down in on the Deusa clubs it's exciting if you show up a little bit early and you're a little hungry we encourage you to go have the biscuits and gravy that, that's put on there at the old uh, downtown park area and that's always being served there by the museum the historical museum it helps them out so start your 4th of July off right get up early get down on the deuce have a great time and and be prepared to spend the night and, and have a great time in Sholo 
Carrie, we appreciate what you do in our Parks and Recreation Service, and we look forward to a fantastic uh, old-fashioned family fun 4th of July. Thanks so much for being with us it's today. It's my pleasure, Mayor. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us today. And if you have any questions that you'd like answered here, you can call us here at City Hall at 532-4061, and we'll answer them here on the show. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.